From Brazil to the world, this is Profit Talks, a podcast produced by Hayek Global College and dedicated to exploring how you can ethically maximize profits. For more episodes, please visit hayekcollege.com slash profit. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, my guest is John Chisholm. John is a technology entrepreneur and angel investor in Silicon Valley. He founded online software companies Decisive Technology, now a part of Google, and Customer Set, now a part of Confirmit. He is trustee of MIT and the Santa Fe Institute and past president and chair of the worldwide MIT Alumni Association. He is also an advisor of Hayek Global College. John, it's a great honor to have you here today. Edson, thanks so much for having me. So John, you, you have written this excellent book called Unleash Your Inner Company, which I have right here. And it's a, a, a very interesting read and we, we have seen great things that you, you talk about entrepreneurship in the book. Um, and, but I would like to, to come in to, to, to uh, ask you a, a personal question. Within the entrepreneurship uh, or anything in your life, what was the biggest challenge you have faced and what did you learn from it? Well, that would have had to have been getting my second company, Customer Sat, through the dot com bust of 2000 and 2001. Uh, the internet was first commercially available and productized back in the 1990s. And during that time, billions of dollars were invested and over-invested in uh, the internet. Products and companies like Amazon and eBay and Google were all started during that time. Well, that huge over-investment reached a climax in 1999 and that big bubble burst and collapsed in 2000 and 2001. And that's known as the dot-com bust. Yeah. During the time, thousands, tens of thousands of companies went out of business. Well, at that time I was running my second company and in this customer set and in the second, in the first quarter of 2001, I would often wake up in sweat soaked sheets sticking to my skin. That's how you start the book, right? Yes. Our second round of financing, our Series B round, refused to close despite a flurry of meetings with investors as we ran out of cash. Those nights I would get up, shower off the sweat, and try to get back to sleep. When my management team and I finally realized that our Series B round was not going to close, we huddled to figure out what to do. First, we cut our own salaries, and then a few weeks later, those of all of our employees by 10%. I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce, 40% of the company I had spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing and I broke down sobbing in front of our employees. They stood there stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed that their CEO was crying in front of them. Wow. Wow. To help us get through, one of our investors lent me $300,000 for the company, but not to the company, but for me to pass through to the company, meaning that I would be personally liable for repaying the loan. Later, I would repay that investor to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful by mortgaging the townhouse that I lived in, in Menlo Park, California. Wow. That first quarter of 2001, our revenues fell by a whopping 20%. That's a lot for a recurring revenue software as a service uh, model company as we were. Uh, we did online customer satisfaction measurement and reporting. Uh, to help us get through, uh, we 
uh, factored receivables. That is, we sold our future receivables for cash today at a 20% discount. It's an expensive maneuver that you don't want to do every day. We moved to the less attractive second floor of our building and rented out the ground floor to another company, another startup. That company quit paying us rent after 60 to 90 days, came in late one night, cleared out all their belongings and disappeared without a trace. Wow. The nightmare would not end. I reduced my salary to minimum wage, the legal limit. Finally, we could see profitability ahead in the third quarter of 2001. And then, as you know, on September 11th, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center in New York. The entire Northeast communications grid was down. It took an entire day just to confirm that all of our employees were still alive. Finally, the next day, I was able to send out a message. All customer said employees are safe. But even though we were 3,000 miles away in Silicon Valley, away from the East Coast of the US, uh, even in Silicon Valley, every company I know of there had clients or customers who lost employees or family members in the terrorist attack. Wow. If the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 did not kill a company, almost certainly the terrorist attacks of September 11th did. Well, we did not make a profit in that third quarter of 2001. We did break even in the fourth quarter. We didn't hire a single new employee for 18 months. The going kept tough for the next two to three years, but we made it through. And the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Now, often I've wondered why did customer sat survive when so many other companies of our size and cohort, I think it's fair to say most other companies of our size and cohort failed. It was that question which led me to write the book, Unleash Your Inner Company. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll say more about the book, but let me just say uh, to answer that question, I absolutely don't think we were smarter than other management teams. We absolutely did not have more in the way of resources than other management teams did. One of our clients was Webvan, which raised $75 million before its IPO and then several hundred million more in its IPO, and then famously declared bankruptcy 14 months after its IPO. Customer Sat only raised $2.94 million in its entire history. So we certainly didn't have more in the way of resources than other companies did. If I had to attribute it to just two factors, I would say it was these. Number one, we cared more deeply about all aspects of our business than other companies and management teams did, about the coolness of our products, about the, our relationships with our customers, and about each other on our team than other management teams did. And second, we stuck with it longer than our others did. As I mentioned, it was another seven years before the company was acquired. Many other companies just gave up and threw in the towel before then. So in short, I would say it was this combination of passion and perseverance that got us through. Passion is an attitude. Perseverance is a feedback and in, is, is, an, is a behavior and in many aspects of our lives, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. Uh, so uh, I can say more about that, but that was the greatest learning that I had, the powerful combination of passion and perseverance. We hear a great deal about passion. We hear a little bit about perseverance. No one is talking about how the two reinforce each other and, and form a positive feedback loop. And, and John, tell us a little bit about that then. Um, you were in the midst of the crisis in 2001 and you, 
you're telling us that passion and perseverance is what got you through. But how did you communicate that to your team? Because you may have a lot of passion and perseverance to, to get your business out of it, but you, you need the commitment of your whole team in order to, to get out of it. And how was that? How was communicating to your team? And how was getting your team involved with, with, with this process? Well, here's a key point. And that is we were in the middle of a huge crisis. Uh, you know, everybody knew that companies around us were going out of business left and right. And uh, the ones, the, the, we had laid off 40% of the workforce. Everybody knew that the 60% of us who were left were absolutely mission critical. So we started with that clear understanding, all of us. And I think of the dot-com bust as like, and, or, and our company as like a crucible in a fire which bonds us all together. So there was very strong employee commitment uh, and loyalty in the company uh, after that experience and, and very little employee turnover, very few departures until the company was acquired seven years later, uh, in 2008. Uh, so I, I, I don't mean to say a lot of it was what I did. I, I tell you a few of the things I did, but I think much of it had to do with our circumstances. Uh -huh. I, there's in the, in the book, I talk a great deal about of the importance of showing appreciation and, and what makes for an effective, appreciated compliment. Uh, the more specific it is, the more detailed it is, the more that it talks about the uh, implications uh, of what somebody has done. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kinds of things, sharing these kinds of things with members of your team are critical. And, yeah. and also having other members of your team share those same things uh, or same ideas with their peers. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these, are, these are some of the things. And t tell us about your, your product. You, you had a, just so we, we can picture here how the business was. You're, you're, you had a, a software as a service and you sold to other businesses, which were other tech companies as well? Uh, we were a B2B business and, and uh, yes, our first clients were other technology firms because remember, this was still in the early days of the internet and not every business had email addresses even <laughs> for their customers. And so our first, our, the, the different vertical markets that we addressed tended to be uh, those in order that uh, those industries tended to get email addresses for their customers. So the first ones were other technology companies, mm -hmm. uh, semiconductors, computers, software, you name it. The second group were, I'd say, telecom companies, telecommunications companies, wireless services, and so forth. They typically had email addresses for their customers. Third was financial services. Fourth was retail and, and so on. So as the, a mainstream phenomenon. So as the dot-com bust came, it started hitting all these companies and they started cutting costs and part of the cost was your service, right? So your, your revenue fell completely because yeah. of the crisis. I think one of the reasons that our revenue did not fall until that first quarter of 2001, even though many companies were going out of business or cutting back in 2000, was because companies were on uh, annual contracts with a switching, ex which uh, concluded on December 31st of 2000. And, and initially we were naive enough to think that we might make it through the dot-com bust without being affected uh, because our revenues weren't that significantly impacted until after the end of 2000. 
but I, as a, again, I think it was because of those annual contracts. Uh, you know, arguably customer feedback is even more important during a downturn uh, because you want to preserve every single customer you can. And of course, we were making that point in our in our marketing. I think it's also interesting to consider what was it that pulled us out of the dot-com bust over the next several years. And I would attribute that to innovation. Uh, the particular innovation that we developed was what we called action management. And this is using business rules to decide whether a survey response uh, should tr either trigger an alert to the right person on a customer service or support team, or even open a case and assign that case to uh, the right uh, uh, individual or team in an organization. So we integrated this case management with the cases opened using business rules based on how valuable the customer was, you know, a platinum customer perhaps, and what their satisfaction scores were and what they were dissatisfied about. Well, that was a really novel feature back in those days. It's pretty standard in what's known as enterprise feedback management systems today. But we were a pioneer in that, and that particularly led us sell to a lot of B2B organizations because their, their clients were large enough so that if there were a platinum client that uh, they wanted they really wanted to make certain that client was satisfied and follow up promptly if they were dissatisfied. Now, now that specific innovation, did it happen uh, before or after the bust? Uh, it happened, well, we started it dur during the bust and we implemented it uh, after. I don't remember the exact timing. We, but we, we, but you, you didn't have it before for the original customers uh, before the bust? One, well, we had a, a, the, the alert feature, which is simply generating an email alert. That feature I know we had, and the, I can't remember exactly when we introduced the, the case management feature, but it was, it was during this time, and it was a unique differentiator. And I talk about it, actually, in the book. Um, it, and the, the, the general principle that I think it demonstrates is the importance for any entrepreneur of trying to keep track and follow adjacent technologies to whatever technology area he or she is working in. Uh, turns out case management is a feature of customer relationship management systems. We were in what's known as customer experience management systems. Well, by being aware of this technology in an adjacent field, we could think about how it might be applied and integrated with our product. Mm -hmm. And uh, so regardless of what your field is, if you can uh, keep alert to uh, innovations, techniques, and so forth that are in use in those, one of them might be applicable to whatever you're doing, and it might become a key differentiator for you. So awesome, John. So tell, tell us a little bit about your book now. Um, it's, a, it's a 10 step process for launching, scaling, and building your ideal business, right? What exactly is this 10 step process? Well, actually, uh, it's a 10 step process, first of all, for discovering and then launching and then scaling up your ideal business. Okay. And uh, there's I think you don't want to overlook the discovering because it is a discovery process, both of you, the entrepreneur, and of customer needs that surround you. First of all, everything starts in the area where you have a key advantage, and that is your areas of passion and perseverance. Okay. So the the first in the first chapters, I ask. Can you think of any aspect of life, in any realm of life, where you've experienced positive feedback between passion and perseverance? When you just stick with something long enough, 
So you start to get good at it and then better at it. And as a result, start to like it and then love it. That's an example of perseverance driving passion. Conversely, you know that if you're already passionate about an idea or in a subject, the hours can go by like minutes while you're engaged in that activity or that subject. That's an example of, of passion driving perseverance. It's easy to persevere in those circumstances, isn't it, if the hours are going by like minutes? So you can see how the two reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. So the first question is, what are areas in which you've experienced these uh, positive feedback loops? Write them down. If you can't think of any, that's okay. The, the book gives you exercises for how you can achieve positive feedback between passion and perseverance. So that's step number one. Step number two is, what are unsatisfied customer needs in those areas of passion and perseverance? I like to say a customer need has two parts, the customer and the need. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's important to say who has the need and also what is the need. Okay. Now you may ask or wonder why is it important in the areas where of your passion and perseverance? Well, as I mentioned or alluded to, there you you have multiple advantages in those areas. One, in the areas that you're passionate and perseverant about, you are trying all the different features, all the different products in that area. And so you're discovering the limitations of those products and services before others do. And that gives you a time to market advantage because one of those limitations might well be a customer need that you address. Mm -hmm. uh, two, it gives you staying power uh, to, be, to be working in those areas. You will run up against all kinds of obstacles like the ones I mentioned uh, during the dot-com bust with your company, having to lay off people, factor receivables, move to smaller offices, uh, uh, the the uh, passion and perseverance working in those areas gives you the staying power to break through those obstacles. And finally, it's contagious to other members of your team. So there's a multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's so important for you personally be so uh, excited and engaged by whatever area that you're working in. So in those areas, we look for unsatisfied customer needs. Yeah, I've just pinpointed a point that I think it's very important. Uh, often when we ask people, what is your passion? It's, it's, hard, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, and the way you frame it and the way you, 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 you help us find it is through, well, find something first that you persevere and then you, you're good at and, and, and you keep doing it. And once you have that, you have that flow, you feel, well, that is part of what, where I can find my passion, right? And how, w w is, is, that, is that how we should look at it? Is, is if you can't find your passion, look at something that you're good at persevering at? Absolutely. Anyone can become passionate about something. It may take time, effort, and perseverance to become passionate about it. But just by applying yourself, going ever deeper, learning more about it, becoming more and more skilled about it, uh, it becomes more engaging and exciting to you, and you become more passionate about it. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So sometimes the perseverance comes before the passion. Absolutely. Abs absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I there's a matrix, a two by two matrix in the one of the early chapters of the book that has passion on one axis and perseverance on the other, and so the two by two matrix is the four combinations of those two being high or low. Well, you can be high in passion, but low in perseverance for a particular area or subject. Mm -hmm. That's not likely to go very far. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a short lived uh, uh, something you're excited about for the short time, or you can be perseverant, but not passionate about it. That's going to be drudgery. Yeah. Uh, not having either is a non-starter. Having the combination of the two is where you want to be. That's variously called flow or being in the groove or uh, whatever you want to call it. Perfect. And what, what is the, the third step? So we have find your passion, perseverance, yes. 
customer needs? Yeah. And then what, what comes next? Uh, well, uh, I could say a great more deal more about the customer needs. Uh, but next is, is what are possible solutions to that customer need? And at this early stage, step number three, uh, we don't have to define the solution fully, but just enough so you can satisfy yourself that yes, there is a solution there and I could provide that solution. Uh, there's still a lot more work to be done in the remaining seven steps to pinpoint uh, what uh, is the exact customer need that you're going to address and how you're going to address it. But in step number three, we just want to make sure that there's an existence proof that yes, there is a possible way that you could satisfy that need. Let's say the need was something like, uh, you know, uh, transferring people or atoms from one location to another Star Trek style. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> the customer need, lots of people would love that. I would that. love that one. <laughs> um, but uh, at this point in time, we don't have the technology, I suspect, to do that, at least yeah. on any significant scale. Uh, and, and so it has to be realistic enough to uh, you know, be within the realm of possibility. That's what we're uh, testing at, at this stage. Incidentally, uh, people often ask, why start with the customer need as step number two? What if I've got a really cool technology? That would be one of my resources uh, and uh, part of the solution. That would be step number three. Why not start there? Well, I like to say that I started my first company with a really cool technology for which there was no market need. What was it? Well, it, I, it was a patent that I had on conditional voting. Um, I won't bore you with what that is. If you're interested, you can look it up. Okay. Uh, my last name in conditional voting. Uh, but it took me six to nine months to let go of that idea and swap it for something for which there was a real customer need, namely the ability to do surveys on the internet. Uh, and uh, so Decisive Survey, which we launched in 1995, before very many people even had access to the web, uh, became a hit. It worked not by requiring people to have access to the web, but by parsing text email messages text messages that you uh, that the software would create uh, using brackets uh, to indicate your choice of you know a b c or d and to fill in the blanks and uh, people would send that back the software would use the messaging api to go into your mailbox retrieve the responses parse them to pull out the survey responses and generate a simple set of analytics that product became a hit Mm -hmm. And that company is part of Google today. So it really does work. Start with a real customer need rather than the cool technology. And you will, uh, you will make sure that way that you are addressing a real customer need. And John, what, uh, exploring more on the customer part, you talk about not listening to your customers, but Ex learning about learning with them, right? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I use the example of the entrepreneur who is in the book who is introduced who is interviewing an elderly couple, and they're insisting that what they need is a better mousetrap. Uh, they have mice in their home, but you're the entrepreneur. And it's your job to think further outside of the box than your customers do and to be aware of new technologies that might be applied to satisfy your customer's need. Uh, and so you ask a whole bunch of questions and you find out really what they're interested in is not uh, having a better mousetrap, but ridding the house of mice in the first place. 
Yes. If you can keep mice from even getting into the house, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about catching them and disposing of them, which is a messy task. Maybe there is some way that using chemicals or audio or electrical pulses or some other means, you could discourage mice from even approaching the house or getting into the house. Uh, and, and so that's an example. Don't listen to your customers. Find out what their goals are. Tr find out what it is they're trying to accomplish. And then that way you can do the research, use your knowledge, use your creativity to try to figure out the best way to accomplish whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. There's a, a great quote by Henry Ford where he says that uh, if I was to ask my customers um, what they wanted, they would say, I want a faster horse and would yes. never imagine that the car would ever be possible, right? So as you said, we, we, we have to think about what customers want. They wanted to move from uh, point A to point B faster and doesn't matter how, how it would come about happening as long as they had that satisfied. So that, that also plays into your, your, your example with the mousetrap, right? Yes. And uh, so let's, let's move on. What, we talked about the three steps and what, what will be the next step now after uh, developing the solution for the customer? Well, there's a construct in the book called your stars. And that's with two A's and two R's. Your skills, the technologies that you know about, your assets, your achievements, your relationships, your reputation, and your strengths as in inner strengths. And something that's a very worthwhile exercise is no matter where you are in life, no matter whether you plan to start at your own business or not, but it is to take out a big sheet of paper, put seven columns on it, one for each of these words. You can use an Excel spreadsheet if you want to, make seven columns there. Down as many resources as you can think of that you, can ha that you have in each of those seven categories. Your skills and technologies would be both the ones that you've learned by formal training in high school or college, uh, and also the ones that you've learned about just by virtue of being passionate in those areas. Your assets may be physical, financial, or knowledge-based. Your achievements are successes you've had in any realm of life, uh, because success in one realm of life can often spill over into other realms of life. Mm -hmm. Your relationships are both personal and professional. Your reputation is how other people know you. And your strengths, as in inner strengths, are qualities that you've demonstrated uh, in the past, such things as creativity, ingenuity, uh, perseverance, passion, compassion, and so forth. Write all of them down, whether or not you think it's relevant to starting your new business or not. It's a good exercise to do with somebody who knows you well because they will see strengths in you uh, that you don't see in yourself. If you have a co-founder in mind, uh, it's a great exercise to do with your co-founder because especially realize that uh, the assets of the business that you're starting will be the combined assets yes. of yours and your co-founder. And then you'll be able to put your two charts together. Well, we, we use this chart, the STARS chart, in four different ways throughout the 10-step process. Number one, we use it to assess the fit between you and each of the unsatisfied customer needs that you've come up with to see where the, fit is, the fits are the best. Two, we use it to see where the gaps are, to see what additional resources you need to develop or acquire to do the best job of satisfying those needs. Three, we use it to innovate 
And as later chapters in the book explain, innovation is largely a process of combining things we already know in novel ways. And this chart lays out what we already know. And so we can use it as a convenient way to consider the combinations of things that we already know and therefore to innovate. And finally, we use it to build our self-confidence. It's hard to start your own business. You'll run up against all kinds of obstacles and by having all of your accomplishments and inner strengths and, and skills and so forth in front of you reinforces your self-confidence. Awesome. And there's a whole chapter on uh, building your self-confidence, and I, I can say more about that if we have time. Yes. Oh, let's talk about it. How, how would you build your inner confidence? Well, the very first chapter I talk about, chapter seven, after uh, the chapter on uh, that lays out the stars chart is called growing your mind from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And that has, I think, seven different ways of building your self-confidence. For example, uh, let me give you a few of the ways. Never say anything negative about yourself. Why is that? But every t the, the mind is like an iceberg. Uh, we're only consciously aware of a small minority, maybe 10% of the messages that come into our minds. The remaining 90% of the signals and messages, things that we see out of the corner of our eye, things that we overhear, enter our minds without our even being uh, consciously aware of them. Well, some of these messages are harmful. Negative messages in particular about ourselves that we repeat again and again, the unconscious mind can accept as truth and it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So no matter uh, what the thing is, don't uh, keep repeating that you're no good at math or no good at sports or no good at self uh, social situations. Rather, Think of a specific time, a specific moment, no matter how small, where you did the opposite. If it was a social situation, you put everyone at ease. If it was the math, you were able to do it in your head. If it was a sport, you were the star. Write down every detail of that specific incident. Make it as tangible in your mind as you can. Maybe think about it as you're falling asleep. Maybe if you have a trophy or a picture that represents it, put that in a prominent place where you can see that and let that reality squeeze those negative thoughts out of your mind. So that's one technique for building your self-confidence. Here's another one. When I was in my mid-30s, I accepted the fact that I'm gay. Most people wouldn't view that as an asset. I disagree. For me, it's been an asset in five different ways. Number one, when you're growing up gay, you know unambiguously, with absolute certainty, that at least some of the world's routine assumptions are wrong. People routinely assume that guys are attracted to gals and vice versa, don't they? But you know it's not universally correct. And so growing up gay has helped me not necessarily accept the status quo and think outside the box. And that's made me a better entrepreneur, manager and entrepreneur. Two, it wasn't socially acceptable to be openly gay when I was growing up. And so at least some of the energy I might have put into dating, I put into sports and school work and career instead. Today, 30 years later, I am hugely enjoying the benefit of that early investment. Three, I'm not a minority in any sense that I, other than the fact that I'm gay. And so at least uh, it, it sensitized me to some of the challenges that uh, being a minority uh, faces. Four, uh, when people see that I'm not trying to hide my sexual orientation, they can see I'm being honest with them and that helps build trust between us. And five, I think it further conveys that I have strength and reserve if I can open about uh, my sexual orientation. Similarly, if there is some aspect of your life that you genuinely cannot change, 
find a way to view it as an asset. Set the bar very high. Don't use this as an excuse to accept some aspect of yourself that you can change and would like to change. But if you genuinely cannot change it, if you can find a way to view it as an asset, it'll be hugely empowering for you as it was for me. And that aspect of yourself will become one of your strengths. A few uh, years ago, I was giving this exact same talk to an auditorium of undergraduates in Guatemala. And as I spoke, about halfway back, a young man who was sitting slowly made a fist and raised it and pressed it up against his chest like this. And at first, I thought it was some small gesture of agreement or support for what I was saying. But then when I looked again, I could see he wasn't making a fist at all. His hand had no fingers on it. And I imagine he was saying, this I cannot change. This is my strength. So again, if there is some aspect of yourself that you genuinely cannot change, find a way to view it as an asset and it will become one of your assets. Yeah, that's very inspiring, John. Um, I think we, we can summarize it as, you know, find if you're if if it's something you can you can you can improve on let's say i'm not good at sales i can't i have a i have i personally have a hard time with that like calling people like you know buy my product and everything yeah i mean as an entrepreneur now starting this the, uh, my own business and uh, at the same time uh, that's something you can change you can improve on right and it's it's not gonna but uh, and, and and if if i keep if i keep reinforcing what I just said right now, I should have done that, but now I'm just giving an example. <laughs> um, it, it, it undermines my possibilities of improving my skills on this certain ability. But at the same time, if there's something else that I can't change, oh, I, I, have, a, I have an accent. I, I'm from Brazil I, and I have an accent. No matter how much I train or how much I speak, I'm still going to have this accent. And it, it reminded me of an example of a similar talk with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he was he was uh, giving a lecture where he said that in the beginning, when he was starting out his acting career, people told him, "Oh, you you're not going to go anywhere because you have a, a funny accent. It's it's not going to make you improve or anything." But he used that as an asset when he was doing the movies, and when um, he said that the the director only called him to do the Terminator because he had uh, an interesting accent that made him look like a robot. So it was at first was a limitation. It became an asset and made him improve on his career because of that. So I think it, it's very powerful, the, 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 the two things you, you just said right now. That's a beautiful example, Edson. Uh, incidentally, one of the things you can say is talk about your limitation, if you have one, in the past tense. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the way I used to be, or <laughs> I'm becoming better at sales. Every day I'm becoming better at sales. Uh, you know, I'm practicing, I'm uh, getting better results. Uh, and, and so you can talk about the trend line, yeah. which, uh, which if you're applying yourself is positive, probably positive. That's a great tip. That's a great tip. So I'm improving a lot on sales and it's making me feel good. <laughs> Um, so, so John, uh, you, you went through a crisis, um, on to the, the 2001 bust and you, you, we, you came out through stronger through the crisis and, uh, it, we, we could look at crisis as a, as a good time to start a business, right? Is it, is it a good time to start a business? So well, right now we're going through probably what is 
one of the biggest crises of our, our lifetimes, right? It's, it's not just only an economic crisis, it's a healthcare crisis, it's a, a moral crisis and political crisis everywhere in the world with the pandemics. And what is the tip that you, you could give right now through people going on through these pandemics who, who would like to be entrepreneurs? Well, in my view, a pandemic, lockdowns, and similar crises, like what we've been experiencing for the last six months or longer, are ideal times to start a new business. That may seem counterintuitive, but let me explain. First of all, uh, during a pandemic or a lockdown, we're not able to travel. Uh, we can't go into the office in many cases. Uh, we can't go to the theater, the movies, outside. And so we've got more time than we normally have. Great. That is time that you can use to delve really deeply to understand customer requirements. Talk to the customers, reach out to them. They're probably available too because they also can't go outside to the movies, theater and restaurants and so forth. Uh, so on the one hand, it gives you time to understand customer requirements too. It also gives you time to explore and research your possible solution to that customer need. Maybe a new technology could be applied. What are the capabilities of that technology and its limitations? How could you uh, work it into your solution? Uh, could you build a prototype during this time? Could you, if it's software, could you develop a prototype and actually show it to people online and get their, their feedback to, from prospective customers? So. There is that whole aspect of a pandemic and lockdown. The fact that we don't have as many day-to-day -day distractions as we normally do. Uh, of course, what are our big distractions from doing these things? Well, probably they're things like video games and, and Netflix and uh, social media. And so if we can just uh, focus on the customer need and our solution to that need and use the time that we might otherwise spend uh, with social media and Netflix and, and video games, then we can make a lot of progress. One of the things I do uh, to avoid those distractions is I don't have a TV. And it's been part of my productivity function, I think, over the last 15 years by not having a TV. Uh, the second part of this is that customer needs are different during a pandemic. Yes, yeah. As we've seen, people need to have food delivered to them, uh, other products and services delivered. Uh, they need to keep in touch with loved ones and family members, even though they can't visit them in person. Uh, people need to get physical exercise and work out, uh, even though they're not allowed to go to their gyms. Uh, they need to prepare food and become chefs and cooks for the first times in their lives very often since we can't go to restaurants. So there's a whole new set of customer needs that emerge during a pandemic, lockdown, or other crises. If you can be first to jump on one of those customer needs, to start addressing it, to in parallel with addressing it selectively for some people, learning about its contours and extent and finding different innovative ways to address it, you can have a time to market advantage uh, over others. Uh, if it's an area in, that you're in an area that you're passionate about, uh, you'll have a natural advantage for the reasons uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, so this combination of having more in the way of time and having a new sets of customer needs uh, are, are what make it such a good time to start a new business. And, and let me say part of the tough calculation that you have to do as an entrepreneur is try to figure out which of those customer needs are going to be short-lived just during the lockdowns and the pandemic, 
and which ones will continue indefinitely or for a longer period of time, even after the lockdown and pandemic end. So uh, here in San Francisco, people are just again being able to go back and use the gym. But on the other hand, uh, employees are being told, at high tech companies at least, are being told that they can work from home indefinitely. So uh, you're going to have to make an investment of some sort into addressing that customer need and coming up with a solution for it. And so you're going to want to make sure that it's around for some period of time. So part of the complex calculation you need to do and research that you need to do and question you need to answer for yourself is how long will this customer need be around? I'm not saying it's easy, but you can do it. And would you say there's a third part as well? Say, for example, uh, the restaurants have uh, many restaurants are going broke right now because they simply do not have enough customers. And um, when the pandemic is over, there is probably going to be a research, uh, reappearance of, of these restaurants. It's, we could, it probably is not going to be the same restaurants that were before, but there's going to be an opportunity for new people to do the same type of business that was possible before the pandemics to, to reappear, right? So probably also the, the just the, the, the mix of the, the, the turmoil of the economy creates some opportunities that changes up who is in charge of, of certain types of businesses, right? Absolutely. It's uh, maybe uh, the opportunity may, to, may be B to B rather than B to C. In other words, uh, maybe your customer are the restaurants and what could you do to help them stay in business? Uh, they, they would probably appreciate that very much. Incidentally, one of the other key lessons of any economic uh, crisis like the pandemic or the, and the lockdowns is the importance of saving something for a, ra a rainy day. Right now, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, it is raining. Mm -hmm. And those people who set aside some resources, both to get through uh, I, at, at a minimum, and ideally to have some extra resources, uh, a great deal of opportunities open up for them because with companies going out of business, uh, you can potentially even buy a business uh, for a fraction of the price you might normally be able to do it. One of the things here in San Francisco we're seeing is that office furniture is available very cheaply because so many offices have closed down. They're serving, selling all that used office furniture. And in fact, one of the companies I'm mentoring right now uh, called Treasure Hunters uh, is providing a uh, online network for people who are looking for office furniture and uh, uh, providing office furniture. So if you can start right now, there's going to be another pandemic lockdown or crisis, I'm sure at some point in the future, in our lifetimes. If you can start preparing it for it right now by living frugally, saving whenever you can, so that when that crisis happens, you have the means to uh, help others by being a customer for whatever assets they're trying to unload, then you will be uh, in uh, an even stronger situation. Those are some great tips, John. Um, I believe our listeners are going to get a lot out of these lessons. Um, we, I'm, I'm just going to reinforce uh, the book. This is John's book, Unleash Your Inner Company. It's a great book, helping me a lot with the business at Higher Global College, so I highly recommend it. And uh, we have a lot more to talk about, but unfortunately, we have to, to stop at this time. We could leave it for a, another episode if John would give us the honor. And I would like to thank our listeners. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, John. Thank you, Edson. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Profit Talks. Now, do you have any comments or other business-related questions? If so, please send us, and we'll be glad to explore it in future episodes. Also, be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. We are on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and many others.